it's time to shake things up a bit. As you might have been aware, this channel has started to look a bit like a football conversation rather than a civil conversation. So for all the people out there who are wanting a break from the football theme, today is your lucky day. We're going back to London. Hey, we're in London, aren't we? Talk about London Underground's most interesting line. That's right, we're talking about the Jubilee line and we're going to tell you what's so special about it. We're going back in time to the early 1930s, to the early beginnings of the line. And in fact, it wasn't even called the Jubilee line back then. The line started from humble beginnings, being a wee branch from Wembley Park to Stanmore, with the Metropolitan Railway bill to serve the commuters in the ever-expanding suburbs of London in 1932. This branch line turned out to be very popular, which created a new problem, and one which is the bane of all Londoners. Just so many people on the blooming trains and stations. This was particularly an issue at Baker Street, which trains on the various lines converged at. Something had to be done. The solution was to build a deep level section of railway, which would provide another route into Baker Street, easing congestion. This section of the line would be swallowed up by the Bakerloo line, and would have two new stations, Swiss Cottage and St John's Wood, as well as losing two existing ones, including one called Lord's, which you might be able to guess what it was serving. Hint, it wasn't a church. The line would emerge from the new tunnel to take over all the local stops from between Finchley Road to Stanmore, allowing for trains on the Metropolitan Line to run faster. This new section of the Bakerloo Line would open in 1939, a few months after the man with the moustache fancied a bit of Poland, sending Europe into a whole heap of bother. Things were all quiet on the Jubilee front for many decades after the war, until the 1960s when London had just opened its latest line, the Victoria Line, and was looking for something else to do. Plans were in the making for a new line, which would be called the Fleet Line, named after the River Fleet which it passed over. The line would take over the existing Baker Street to Stanmore branch of the Bakerloo line, passing through central London and out to the suburbs in the southeast of the city. The first thing to do for this new line was to construct some more tunnels into central London, which commenced in 1971. And by 1979, the line had got to Charing Cross, with stops at Bond Street and Green Park along the way, when it decided to open. The line showed nothing is more powerful than the Queen of England, not even rivers, with the line being christened the Jubilee Line to commemorate the Queen's Silver Jubilee, and to be honest is a better name than the Fleet Line anyway. So now London had this fancy new line, but the problem was it was only half finished, and if you know anything about British history, the country wasn't floating in money during the 1970s. Where's my money? You gonna give me my money? Where's my money man? So it just basically stopped at Charing Cross for nearly 20 years until something was done to move it on its way. Various proposals were put forward onto how to finish the line, including one which would take the line over the river to penetrate the heart of South East London to a place called Hayes, wherever that is. Forgive me, I'm a northerner. However, whilst the 90s were happening, there was this new fancy financial district popping up in the east of London, which went by the name of Canary Wharf, which was just crying out for decent transport links. The stage had been set. The sequel to the Jubilee Line story would be to route the line over the river, ditching the existing Charing Cross station to become a Hollywood film set, past the home of the nation's biggest lunatic asylum, Sit or die. I know what I'm doing. and out to Canary Wharf before coming back over the river to penetrate East London, terminating at Stratford. Construction on a new section of line started in December 1993. The first challenge was Westminster Station, which if you ever went through it back in the day, is nothing like it is now. Unfortunately, as a millennial, I have no recollection of it either.
With the Jubilee line coming to town, this required a full reconstruction of the station, which was no easy feat. To build the station, it required 39 metre deep open excavation, the deepest ever completed in central London, with the deepest in London being Tottenham's attempt to find their trophies that have gone missing over the past decade. You keep digging like this, you're gonna go straight through to China. If it happens, it happens. The excavation allowed them to fit all the tube stuff inside, but there was another problem. With Big Ben being pretty much next to the station, there was a chance it could become the Leaning Tower of Westminster because of the station construction. The answer was to install a series of 50 metre long steel tubes around the clock tower's foundation in which grout was injected if the tower got a wee bit tipsy. This allowed for the tower to settle to an acceptable level without falling to pieces. Stainless steel and concrete was used throughout the design of the station, which in normal circumstances would be as good looking as a Boris Johnson tackle. But the architects managed to pull it off and it's a rather nice looking station in my opinion. Shout out to the Turtleneck Squad. To keep the station hidden underground, Portocollis House was constructed on top, which is an office for the MPs and cost a whopping £235 million. Following on from Westminster are stations at Waterloo, Southwark, London Bridge, Bermondsey and Canada Water, which were built in a futuristic style and are stunning stations in their own right. But the big ticket item of the extension was Mr Moneybags himself, Canary Wharf. This station was built with the intention of being the showpiece of the extension from the off and got the top dog of architecture, Norman Foster, to design it. Foster had based his designs off previous work he had done on the Bilbao Metro and the station was to be enormous, being designed to cater for high passenger numbers and is actually the only station on the network that can cope with the passenger flows during rush hour. The station was built on a drained former dock to which a cut and cover method was applied to build a 24 metre deep pit to build the station and the station is truly a sight to behold being consistently voted the most loved tube station and you can certainly see why. After that we move on to the station that caters for a big tent at North Greenwich then up to Canning Town, West Ham before terminating at Stratford the home of that stadium which is supposedly good for football. The new section of the line was finished by December 1999 ready to see in the new millennium and has gone on to be an integral part of the network and allowed the Jubilee line to be London's favourite line. Well, according to Google, and I'd probably have to agree with them. Sorry Northern Line, but you're just too ruddy noisy. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and consider hitting that subscribe button. And stay tuned as we carry on telling you the stories of the world's greatest achievements, one wonder at a time. This has been a Silver Conversation, and I will see you in the next video.